Thank you very much for being here. I feel like applauding already. <laughs> and let's do that. Right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. So it's wonderful to see everybody, and it's wonderful to have these many people turn out for a poetry reading. I, I know it's Annie, so we've got a real treat tonight. And I'm going to be introducing her in uh, just a bit. I'm Tom Hogan, the uh, director of the Milwaukee Poetry Series, and we want to welcome you to the, uh, the Letting Library. How many people haven't been in the library yet? This is your first time? Wow. Wow. Okay. Thank you for being here at the, at the library. Uh, I want to make a thanks to those uh, of you that are watching on the live stream. So thank you for logging in and for this reading. Uh, we appreciate that. And really, we had to pull the blinds maybe 10 minutes ago. And I suppose a day and a half ago, I never would have thought that we would be doing that and that the sun would be, would be here. But it's, it's lovely. So we had to do that. And there are a lot of demands on our time. And because of that, we're very happy that you came out and you wanted to spend the time with poetry and with Annie and, and with all of us. So again, thank you very much. I have some other uh, specific thanks I want to make to Wonders to the City of Milwaukee. So uh, we have been supported by the City of Milwaukee from the beginning. Uh, we're currently in our 17th year, which is, we're very, very, very happy about that. I don't think we thought that at the beginning. You don't start out and say, well, we're going to do this particularly, but we want it to go as long as it can. A big thanks to the uh, Letting Library. We've been uh, associated with the library also from the beginning. So um, we were uh, had our first venue, Annie Red, initially in the Pond House. So we were at the Pond House for, uh, for a number of years. But thanks to uh, the Letting Library, and we have a beautiful new library. Also thanks to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. So we do have a, a committee, and as you know, you don't have things that happen unless you have a group of people that are working on it. So we have a couple of members here. Well, hey, Kristen, you're the one in addition to me that's here. So <laughs> let's, give Kristen, let, let's give the committee a <laughs> hand. Thank you, thank you very much for, for what you're doing. I want to say just a, a word about a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, we have our bilingual reading. It's something we've done every year. We needed to uh, reschedule it, but it is a Sunday, March 24th, here, 3 to 5, and we will be reading poems in uh, English and Arabic. So it's a chance to uh, hear poems read in Arabic, and it's a partnership that we're doing with the Al-Mutanabi Street Starts Here Coalition. Uh, Donna Henderson is going to be here next month, and she is going to be uh, our reader. I want to say something about posters. So we do have posters of the, uh, the series. So I think many of you may have gotten one, but please take them. That's what they're for. If you know a place that you would like to put it up, we'd be very happy about that. And so take them, share them. Uh, again, as I say, that's what they're for. Also call your attention to a, a contest. There's a writing contest going on now for those of you who work or live in Clackamas County. And it's sponsored by the Clackamas County Arts Alliance. So take a look at that. And you will have to go on, um, go online. But you can Google that, and the entry form uh, will come up. Also, a big thanks to, to them. Uh, we are the recipient of a grant this year again from the Clackamas County Arts Alliance. So we are uh, very happy about that. And those are the announcements that I want to make. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our poet tonight. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, I already said that Annie's read here once before, and previously she read, you can't hear me? Okay. Well, I guess you really have to talk into the mic. All right. I've got it down here. It's a little lower for Annie. Uh, <laughs> I need to do this. So, good, thanks. So she began writing poetry after her first visit to Oregon Old Growth Forest. 
and now writes and teaches poetry wherever and whenever she can. Poems from her book Pax, or Pax, an iron string, have been turned into music used in meditation and healing projects in many different countries and have traveled further than she has. She wishes they would take her with them. So, it's a lot of pleasure. Would you uh, join me in welcoming our poet this evening, Annie Lightheart. Annie. Okay. Oh, and I, I forgot to say, please silence your, like, your telephonic devices. I never get over the fact that people leave their houses for poetry. <laughs> this, is, this stuns me every time I see anybody at a poetry reading. So thank you so much for coming. It's a joy to be here. And I promise my friend in the back, if I'm not loud enough, he's going to go like this so that I think I'm doing OK. But it's a secret signal for turn up the volume. How am I doing, Leon? It's OK? All right. If at any time I dip down, please let me know. We short people have a little bit of trouble with the microphones. I want to thank Tom and the Milwaukee Poetry Series for giving us this night. The fact the series has been going on for 17 years is no small thing. I think, oh, yay, Tom. <laughs> I think the moments when we feel all is right with the world are very few and far between. And for 17 years, this series has been providing those moments once a month. And hardly anyone creates a leisurely hour for poetry that includes a question and answer, period. So this series genuinely welcomes a deep dive into poetry that is so rare in the world. But I have to tell you standing up here that the gift of that hour goes against my early training as a po public speaker. <laughs> when I started, my director gave me with great persuasion the five B's of public speaking. He taught them to me, he emphasized them vigorously and I took them deeply to heart. The five B's of public speaking are, be brief, baby, be brief. <laughs> <laughs> as an introvert, and as someone who knows that poetry scares the daylights out of many people, I've become accustomed to giving a poetry reading as briefly as possible and getting out while the getting is good. <laughs> But tonight, I'm going to put the five Bs aside, and I'm going to read a bit longer. So I welcome you to get up and stretch any time you need to, and to take the advice of my father, who I mentioned at the series years ago, believed that poetry is best received with the eyes closed. <laughs> and if it leads you gently to fall asleep, may it be a rewarding poetic sleep. <laughs> So at the risk of starting with a soft, possibly sleepy poem, here's a poem to welcome you into the evening that just happens to be called, It Is Evening. Morning is forgiving, afternoon not nearly so, but evening softens everything, butters the world in old yellow light, lays an easy hand on the slow dog's pain. It is evening, and Michelangelo leaves off painting the heavens, comes to rest on the ground. It is evening, and the bakers of time brush down the ovens and cool their skin. Evening brings ease, and a line of ants to carry off our grains of confusion. 
evening drapes itself pleasantly on your shoulders and unlocks the complex door of the day. The knife of night is not yet here. Now leap clear of memory. Name yourself new. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm gonna disappear for a drink of water, not because you applauded. <laughs> How's this? Is this working? Okay. Keep me on my toes. I just realized I have no real segue into this next poem. Um, <laughs> just a confession. This year I have become obsessed with honey. I'm not a honey aficionado, but I am very passionate about it. Honey on toast is one of the first things I think of when I open my eyes in the morning. Walt Whitman once said that he thought that there were some themes that poets love best, um, night, sleep, death, and the stars. But for me, honey has outstripped all these, <laughs> even death, which is strange. It's just become incredibly metaphoric, sweetly metaphoric. So this is a honey poem, a love poem to honey. Feast. The way the toast takes to the honey. The way the honey transfers to each hand, eagerly, deftly. Then, the way the hand honeys everything. Teacup, knife, glasses, nose, even this otherwise empty page. For this is the way sweetness moves through the world. A little touch here, a bit of unexpected stickiness there, and the whole house holds together, the day and each year, the tired parents and the jubilant children born with the taste. For this is the fingerprint pressed gently on forehead and eyes, on doorstep and leaf. Once only? Or many times? Oh, many and many. The touch of sun comes to the window, and we wake again in feast upon feast. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you don't know how to applaud. My blush is just going to like rise up. Part of the great delight for me is being in the Letting Library this evening. You might know the great Argentine poet and librarian, Jorge Luis Borges. He once said that he always imagined paradise would be a kind of library. <laughs> and I totally agree. My family and I moved from Portland to Milwaukee this fall. And one day while driving home past the library, my husband said, I love living here. Is it entirely possible that we moved to Milwaukee just so we could call this our home library? <laughs> yes, it is entirely possible. We love this library. This library is a vibrant, remarkable place. We've been coming here for 15 years, back when my children used to roll around on the rug in the old basement. And so I'd like to dedicate the next four poems to the librarians and staff of this library, and actually librarians the world over. I've been kind of thinking of this part of the reading as librarians I have loved. <laughs> so in fourth grade, our school librarian, Ethel Skinner, lit a spark in me. She worked with my glorious fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Cornell, to help each student author a book. I wrote a book of poetry that was modestly titled, Thoughts About Everything Around Me. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing it was only about 12 pages long though, I apparently didn't have that many thoughts. <laughs> but the experience of making the book changed my life. I lost the book some years ago in a cross-country move, but 
I do have one apparently deeply felt poem memorized. And so I don't know if it prefigures my current poetry. I'll let you decide. So here is the early poem, age nine. It's called Oceans. The waves leap and roll on the sand like clowns in a crowd. The audience claps loud. This is what I hear as I drink my beer. <laughs> when my parents read the poem, they were horrified. My mother said to me, why on earth would you put a beer in the poem about a beach? And I said, because that's where you and dad drink it. <laughs> Poetry speaks the truth. <laughs> and the reason I mentioned that early book is because Ethel Skinner not only taught us how to make a copyright page, which I just love, and a table of contents, she taught us one of the most wondrous things of all, the Dewey Decimal System. Because each of our books was given a decimal number and it was put on the shelf in the library for the rest of the year, placed on the proper shelf with the proper number. I used to visit my book at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> our books became real books because they were in the library. And that early experience gave me a lifelong admiration for librarians and their work. I feel the same way about libraries that I do about poetry. Um, gratitude and affection and amazement at how they give people the chance to share ideas and kindness, stories and both quiet space and speech. I keep my library card in my wallet right on top so that when I open up my wallet, instead of seeing a credit card, I see my library card. It's totally geeky. <laughs> but it reminds me every day what's important. Um, community over commerce, sharing over hoarding. So I'd like to read these poems in honor of the library for Jana, who helps me scour the shelves for children's novels, for Laura, who has the uncanny ability to find interlibrary loans for genuinely obscure books, and for all the librarians and staff up front and behind the scenes. And so this first poem is called The Library in Summer. It has the silence of a ship at anchor, wood resting from wind, Spanish whispers of studying girls, thin heat rising. Looking for a book, I could be lulled into any row and lost, set adrift by the call of the number-tuned bindings climbing their faraway scale. And I could never be sure if looking out the tall windows, I might see flocks of birds, of books escaping, flocks of books a few setting off for the city, the rest contemplating the evening from the green pages of trees. Over the years, I've come to think of librarians not just as the crew of this beautiful ship, but as guides, and if it's okay with the librarians as present, um, as shepherds. <laughs> because when I've just finished a good book and I don't have a next one in hand, I am definitely a lost sheep. I tend to get a bit, just a bit desperate, although my husband might say pathetic is more likely, and I might be prone to saying dramatic things like, that was the best book in the world. I will never find another book as good as this one. I will never find another book that I carry with me everywhere, that I read while I'm brushing my teeth, never. But then I go to a librarian, and I explain that I'm in that abyss between books. And they'll say, what about this one? This has kind of a similar feel to it, or this one's totally different, but I think you might like it. 
and I leave the library with a new book, hopeful and restored, shepherded in the very best way. So although this next poem is, it's a guilty admission about a book I haven't yet finished, and I had to think twice about reading it here and confessing that, it does describe that incredible feeling when you find a book that opens up your heart and your mind. It's called Serious Literature. The book I have never finished reading knows I avoid it. I watch it uneasily. It likes to nudge its fat spine to the edge of the shelf, likes to consider a fall in which it would land like a cat if a cat were a book, which is to say easily and open to just the right page, which is the page near the end I have never quite reached, the one that will make my eyes into canyons, the one that will make my mouth break from my mind, so that silently I will doubt all other truths and live differently, or, if not that, then at least live happily, stunned as I will be by the buoyancy of time inside the stern covers and the light pouring out on my face looking in. brought a strange little poem that's basically a super fast tour through some of the most loved old books on my shelf. It runs from Beowulf through the Brontes to Gilgamesh, the Iliad, St. Francis's Canticle, and it ends with Wolfram von Eschenbach's Grail Romance, Parzival. It's a highly opinionated list, and it leaves out about a thousand books including all of Jane Austen's, which I'm just going to admit is a crime. I couldn't fit them all into the poem. But the last few lines refer to what is my top favorite moment in Wolfram's book, in which the title character, Parzival, who is pretty much a goofus from the beginning, talks with the Fisher King. And this is a spoiler alert for anybody who might not know this romance but it's worth spoiling because the moment is so beautiful that what ha knowing what's going to happen doesn't spoil anything. It just kind of doubles the delight. And what happens is both soulfully beautiful and practically beautiful. So, Parzival is this guy who becomes a knight despite knowing nothing of the world of chivalry or basically the job itself. And because he's such a goof when he starts out, he's given the advice not to go around asking questions. He takes this very seriously, and it leads, of course, to mistakes and dire consequences. Parzival's uncle is the Fisher King, who has led a life of violence, and he now suffers incessantly the torment of his last wound. And long story short, no one can heal the Fisher King, but it just so happens that when Parzival grows in heart and mind, he hits on the cure for his uncle. He simply asks him a question, and the question changes everything. I'll let the poem tell you what question he asks. The poem is called, Why Read Old Books? Why Read Old Books? Because Beowulf also wants a way out of a tense and violent age, as does Hrothgar with his geopolitics and the practical troubles at home in the hall. Because the Brontes plus Moors. Because Enkidu. Because Gilgamesh wept. Because Hector takes off his helmet. Because Francis sings of the sun because knuckle-headed Parzival eventually cuts to the chase and asks, Uncle, 
what ails thee? And manages to unshackle us all. It's Parzival's question that undoes me every time. It's so simple, and yet it cuts like a knife to the heart of the matter. What would happen if we really asked people how they were doing? And what kind of healing would happen if we really wanted to know? So here's one last book poem dedicated to our loved librarians. And it's one that's hard for me to read, but I read it for the first time last fall. And a wise and kind person heard me and told me to keep reading it. The wonderful author you may know, Barry Lopez, he once said, if stories come to you, care for them and learn to give them away when needed. Sometimes a person needs a story more than food to survive. So I'll read this poem, this little story. It involves my father, and it's about the gift of books he gave me while I was growing up. The books were, they were quiet consolations and connections. They were also doors that let me escape a difficult house for a while. My father introduced me to Anne of Green Gables, which was a pivotal book in my life, because Anne had a vivid imagination and made lots of mistakes, which was essential for my childhood. But many of the books my dad gave me were books of fairy tales. The bookhouse books, if you know them, were top favorites. They were his when he's little. And they introduced me to the way stories can work. Fairy tales show us a cruel world, but also a world where magic happens. And the world of fairy tales has its own rules. And this poem delights in a particular rule that's from the Brothers Grimm story about Sleeping Beauty. It's called Little Briar Rose. And the rule is that once a bad thing is done, it cannot be completely undone, but it can be changed. It can be rearranged. It was a key lesson for my life. One of the rules of stories. The fairy godmothers who bring blessings to the child cannot undo the curse of the one who gave the gift of harm. But we are to keep in mind the proper order of the tale. The curse is given before the last good godmother bends over the cradle. And so what cannot be undone can at least be tempered or encompassed in a kinder hand. In such a way, during the terrible years, my father gave me, his strange youngest, books to read alone in my room, saying, good things often come late and small, meaning his gift and my life at the same quiet time. <laughs> and now for something completely different. Now that I've read some meditative poems, I'm going to fess up in case you think I'm a person who can tap into serious depths on a regular basis. <laughs> this next poem accurately describes what happens when I try to sit in silence whether to try to get ready to write or to meditate, my quiet mind doesn't last very long. You know how some people time how long they can hold their breath? I've actually timed how long I can quiet my mind. And so this poem is very truthfully called After Five Minutes of Meditation. After five silent minutes, all the thoughts in my mind turn into dogs. My head, an old Volkswagen, made for dogs to leap into. 
for dogs to go fast in. Dogs smudging the windshield as more dogs materialize. Tails and slobber flying until there are hundreds of dogs hanging out the windows, half of them considering a jump, half excitedly scratching the paint, all howling loudly at other thought dogs lolling unleashed in the street. I would laugh if the dogs weren't such ruthless backseat drivers. Every dog so relentlessly sure that this is the right turn, this the only route, and my mind the best clunker, the prize junker for the fast, unlicensed ride of their lives. I would laugh if they hadn't locked all the doors. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone in that. <laughs> you, you've restored my faith. <laughs> Thank you. I brought a poem that I'd like to read for all the poets out there, the hidden or the not-so-hidden poets, the new poets, and the seasoned ones. It's really lovely to be together in poetry. Poetry is... It is this mysterious thing. You know how you're supposed to have an elevator speech for your work or your latest project? You know, it's sort of a vivid, quick description that can be delivered in the space of an elevator ride. I've been writing poetry for a long time now, and I still don't have my elevator speech nailed down. If you catch me on an elevator and ask me what poetry is, we're gonna have to ride a long time. <laughs> But I do keep a list of favorite definitions of what poetry is. A professor I once met, the poetically named Huck Gutman, gave me one of my favorite ones. He said, poetry is the last best way of one person talking to another. The last best way of one person talking to another. And the New Zealand poet James Baxter defined poetry as a plank laid over a lion's den, which feels just about right because poetry is stronger than it looks, is more necessary than it seems to the larger world, and can carry us over the abysses that inevitably open up in our lives. And poetry is also wily. So I can say all these things about what it is, and then tomorrow I go back to a blank page and I have to wade into new waters. So this poem is for poets. It's about the writing life and for certain hopes for that blank page. It's called Authorial Intentions. Suddenly, all words sound like improbable words, oddly bumpy, like Connecticut. Strangely unspellable, like minuscule. Or possibly missing a secret letter, the way for years I decisively believed Sherbert had a second R. All this concluding in the thought that becoming an author is both unlikely and absurd, as is my continued effort to make poems right to fix them just so, though no voice from above decreed it might be a good idea to write, no prophet proclaimed how wise to go into debt for a remarkably unmarketable MFA. <laughs> and yet I still wade out in language when the tide comes in, still sit at the table drawing up plans to make a chair fly, trying to light a few clauses decently on fire so as to send up a little beacon that might find you and comfort you inside the covers of some improbable book that is most likely thin 
but still legit on some lonely night when all other lights go out. Lately, I've been working with people who are much younger than me. And aside from being startled at finding myself older, <laughs> I'm startled at the great gap that opens up between people, between generations, when you talk about music. I tend to think of music as relatively timeless. My dad could sing Begin the Begin or The White Cliffs of Dover songs that he heard when he was 18 and drafted into World War II, and the time came alive for both of us, which is why when I was humming a Bee Gees song the other day, I was taken aback that the Bee Gees have been pretty much wiped out of the younger generation's playlist. And a playlist, for those of you who don't know, is like a mixtape <laughs> with no tape. <laughs> I do know the Bee Gees aren't going to have a shelf life like Bach or Beethoven, but I had hoped they would last just a generation more. So this is a poem for those feather-haired Australian angels. <laughs> it's a true story about station 98.7 KISD, KISSED, <laughs> in South Dakota. And if you hear the song, How Deep Is Your Love, going through your head while I read it, so much the better. It's called, And Suddenly, 98.7 KISD. Some blessings come in the form of soft rain, soft hands, of rays and darkness. But in the car, on the long cross-country drive west, they came as infrequent frequencies, snagged by the chunk of radio in an old Ford wagon. It didn't matter that they were half melody, half static. They sunk into us like water, because the baby slid a quarter into the CD slot back in Vermont, <laughs> leaving us the long road and little control over what came through the air. Polkas, dire sermons, Helen Reddy, really bad news. Metallica, a trickle of harpsichord. One inexplicable voice singing like a mosquito for miles. And then floating out over South Dakota like three feather-haired Australian angels. The Bee Gees, blessed be they, <laughs> drifting in and out the crank down windows, the baby asleep, the tank mostly full, the Bee Gees right here in this world of fools, our eyes in the morning sun and the car not yet breaking down. Three minutes and 58 seconds of Bee Gees cruising us past dust fields and shacks, arms out the window as if we were flying the car and really meaning to learn. <laughs> I never thought I'd get to write a poem about the Bee Gees. <laughs> For the past few years, I thought I was seriously writing a poem about the body. And this next poem is about a very specific part of the body. And it's modeled after the 17th century poet, um, Christopher Smart. Fantastic poem about his cat, Geoffrey. Geoffrey's possibly the most famous cat in English literature. And Smart starts out, for I will consider my cat, Geoffrey. And he goes on to describe him in just glorious detail. And you might know that he inspired Mary Oliver's poem, For I Will Consider My Dog, Percy. The inspiration hit me closer to home, and so this poem is a poem to my teeth. 
It's called examination. For I will consider my teeth, for they are at once a great blessing and bane, for they are younger than me and yet more speedily decline. For their wisdom was impacted and pulled fourfold. <laughs> For this was done by force and regretted. For they are a tribe. For each day they call roll by means of the tongue. For they have learned by heart their appointed tasks. For some make themselves hatchets. For some do the work of a mortar and pestle. For some live by the sign of the dog and thus tear. For half live upstairs, half down, and come together amenably for meals. For they are the servants of the jaw, duly and daily at work. For they brood over a host of sweet things. For with age, a blast of cold dismays. For the sound of the drill is a scourge. For one suffers heavily under the burden of a crown. For they rue giving pain and grieve the tiniest hole. For the witch penance they nightly abide the whip. For they reside in darkness and do not complain. I like how the floss one takes a minute to register. <laughs> for they tell stories of the vastness outside. For in their myths, the gods are great oaks. For they consider themselves also noble and rooted. For they, like the branch, pushed forth well-loved buds. For they knew that with the little ones, they must be parted. For this is one of the many trials they accept with resignation. For they are inhabitants of a venerable house. For they realize there is no turning back. I have three more poems, and two of the three have Latin words in them. I'm married to a medievalist, and we have a very nerdy household. And so Latin kind of floats around a lot. This particular phrase is fragiles ratus, and it means fragile craft. It's from an old poem by the Roman poet Horace. And I borrowed it because I love that it has a triple meaning. I did mention nerdy. It means three things. So it means a ship at sea, like a, a vulnerable sailing craft. It means also a mortal body, which is definitely a fragile craft. And it also means poetry, which is seemingly a fragile craft of breath and words. But while the phrase does have fragility in it, it also has the converse idea of strength because all three things, the ship, body, and poetry, travel. They all have a remarkable strength and soundness to them. Fragile craft. See how the sidewalk does not attempt to be a boulevard. Be like that, a stretch of plain self from door to street. Be the ant moving toward a crumb on the plate, one of many climbing enormity. Haven't you had enough of the thin film of disguise, the dodge, the fever of persisting in what is not quite true, some better other self? Culprit of your own life, try a true name. Call yourself love. Call yourself dear one. Put an arm around your shoulders and go home for soup and crackers and a glass of ginger ale. 
In the morning, the fever might be gone, burned up in one clean, honest sleep. The hand on your forehead could be your own, as well as the physician's pronouncement, fragiles ratus, the fragile craft, mortal, but still able to rise. And this next poem is called Pax, and it's the poem on your broadside. I'd like to thank the Milwaukee Poetry Series for making broadsides. They feel like party favors, and this, they make this a party. This feels like such a lucky celebration. I once admitted to Tom that naming my book Pax, Peace, took all the moxie I had. Because how, in these terrible times, could you name a book Pax or Peace? But I have children. I have hope. So how could I not? I name the book Pax because I love and believe in peace. And it's in Latin because I love the word Pax more than I do the English word peace. I think it's that squeaky E in the English word peace that makes it sound deceptively smooth and easy. But we all know that peace is not an easy thing. It has never seemed to be an easy thing in any place at any time. And that's why I love the grittiness of the word pax. I love how it looks and sounds like pox. And I love that it feels like a stone that gets in your shoe. It should. It should worry you until you, <laughs> you work it out. I love the fact that such a small, gritty word represents such a huge, spacious idea. And I think that sometimes we need to get startled out of a word or an idea in order to see it again, in order to reconsider our relationship to it. And I love that Pax is an old word. It goes back and back in the troubled history of the world, and it still exists. We humans, we have a terrible track record in terms of making peace happen, and yet we still have words for it in every language, in every culture. So during the pandemic, I had the lucky chance to take part in a reading of English and Arabic po poetry put on, as Tom mentioned, by this series and by the organization Al Mutanabi Street Starts Here. Al Mutanabi Street, if you, if you don't remember back a while, is the historic book selling market in Baghdad. And it was bombed, it was leveled in 2007. And the car bomb set there not only killed and injured people, it destroyed books. And it destroyed a traditional center for literacy and debate. And Al Mutanabi's yearly commemorations are seeking to celebrate that free exchange of ideas and, novel, and uh, knowledge. And so it was such a joy to have a poem translated into and read in Arabic with thanks to Dr. Buhar Budi for this Arabic translation. It's just a little poem, it's just seven lines long, much like peace, if you blink, you'll miss it. <laughs> so I'll try to read it slowly. Pax. Peace came with no words. It was a frame around darkness, the gate to a city far in my head. It contained murders and torture, death circled by fire. It held also the husk, the green spur, and the strong second leaves. It was a new bird a broad field like the sea. Peace was the shore. It was deep in the world. You were there. We were many. There were no separate stars in that sky.
Thank you. And this is a last poem. It's a new poem. It's called Return. And it used to have a tiny epigraph that said, a small reminder for myself. But I changed it to a small med meditation in case you might need it too. I send it out with many thanks for you coming tonight for this chance to be together. Return, a small meditation. If you have gone away from your life because you are afraid or because your life is too small to lay down in at night, too worn to consider mourning anymore, or even a day in which you might be content, come back. Come back to your life the way an old dog comes back to the house and quietly lays by the door. If you too can sleep unnamed and uncalled for a while, there may be other comforts you have not foreseen. Grief and fear may kick at the gate, but for you, there is only one thing. Mouth and nose bring air. Belly rises and falls. You are moored right here, right here. You are moored right here. Thank you. Don't go away. Don't go away. Thank you, Annie, for that wonderful time spent. We're going to have some uh, short Q and A's, and how that's going to work is that Kristen has a microphone, and raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. She's going to bring you a, a mic, and please speak into the mic because we'd like to get both the question and the answer on the recording. There's one right here, Kristen. Here we go. I forgot about this part. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to pay you to ask only easy questions. <laughs> I think it's on now. Okay. okay. Oh, young lady. Very close to it. <laughs> Old lady. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I felt so seen, particularly with that last poem. Oh, my gosh. That was, I'm going to think about that a long time. One thing that you said that struck me in my heart, as you said, when you were talking about the poem Fragilis Rafa, forgive me if I don't get that, um, you said poetry is a craft of breath and words. You said breath first. I'd like to know more about that and how it informs your poetry. That is not an easy question. <laughs> I'll see you later, young lady. <laughs> poetry is an old, old art. And we literate cultures tend to forget this. It becomes something that gets closed in the cover of a book and becomes something that is just between eyes and page, between page and whatever voice we hear in our mind. But for me, Poetry has never stopped being an art of breath and breathing because for me, the last stage, it's never last. I'm always working on the poems. If I could come and scribble in your book right now, I would scribble things in. <laughs> but the last, after I have a poem on the page, I read it out loud. 
and I read it out loud many times, and I go back and I change things. So it has never stopped being an art of the breath. It has never stopped being something that gets said aloud. And it's nights like tonight when I remember that the most clearly, because I, you are here, your breathing contributes to this breathing of the words on the page, and it becomes what poetry originally was, which was a back and forth between people. And that, that is such a beautiful thing, that that's why these readings, these series are so important, to have that give and take, and to remember that something changes when we say words out loud. I mean, something, some, some magic alchemical thing happens when we speak the words out loud. So we, as much as we, as much as I love writing and things like that, the words have to be said out loud in our personal relationships as well as poetry. But I think that's where it comes from. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> good? Final point? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Annie's going to end the event tonight with a final poem. So this very last poem is part of a longer poem called Remarkable Lives. And it is for you for your remarkable life. There are those who have flown low over the savanna and seen the wild running herds and the waves of birds rising. Those who have sunk themselves into the ocean and come up with news. Those who have seen the many cities and people all of us strange and new, even after all of this time. Those who have heard the old songs and speech, who live near the minarets, the mountains, the farthest crumbling walls, the spaces that open to wind and grasses and are complete. And this morning, in a plain yellow room, the baby who took my face in his hands and looked in my eyes, a line of light between us. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for all of the things that you've given us to take with us tonight. Thank you for being here. I'll just say uh, next month, uh, Donna Henderson uh, is going to be here. So if you'd like, love to see you back. Thanks for being here. Thank you for logging in on online, too. Thank you. <laughs>